Parables. And uh, parables weren't just told to entertain. Uh, they were always told to make a point. And so the story is not the story itself. There's always something behind the story that Jesus is trying to use the story to make a point. And so today we want to look at the story that Jesus tells about purity. And there are five kinds of purity that are actually developed in this text. And the first one that we find in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, is what I call a pharisaical purity. Now, the Pharisees were a sect. They were a group. Anybody could join them in the day. You could have joined them. Anyone could join the group. You just had to pledge yourself to the following of one of the rabbis and his interpretation of the law. And these rabbis were usually pretty straight-laced and pretty strict. And so you had all kinds of rules and regulations that you followed that the rabbi told you, and you followed them to the letter that you possibly could. In fact, what the rabbi said to you was more important than what the scripture said. Now that's kind of mixed up. That's kind of like following the preacher instead of Jesus. But that's what was going on. They were, they were people had joined them. Now the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law, that would have been, you know, the teacher of the Pharisees, the guys that were the rabbis teaching and instructing. They came from Jerusalem and they gathered around Jesus and they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean. And then he puts in there, that is unwashed. Now, of course, this is not about personal hygiene. The you know, first thing you're thinking is, well, what's wrong with washing your hands before you eat? <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with washing your hands before you eat. And that's just personal hygiene. But what the, the Pharisees had done is they come up with all kinds of, of ceremonies that you would go through, that you would have to wash ceremonially your hands before you eat. Otherwise, what you touched would be unclean. And so then you couldn't eat it because if you ate it, then it made you unclean. And so they went through all these procedures, and some had different kinds of procedures that you had to go through, but they were just ceremonial washings that are not found in the Scriptures. And so they came to Jesus and said, and these ceremonial washings, the Pharisees, that the, it says, the Pharisees and all the Jews uh, do not eat unless they give their hands to ceremonial washings, holding the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. Why? Because maybe you touch something that made your hands ceremonially unclean, and then when you eat, it goes in you, it makes you unclean. And they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups. Oh no, I, I got, I've come from the market, I've got to wash this cup. I've got to wash it ceremonially before I, I drink out of this cup. And, and their ditches, their, their kettles and all that. They had all these rules that they had added onto the Bible. Have you ever known of some rules that people have added onto the Bible? Every now and then there are rules like, you know, that uh, you can't go to the movies. Did you ever hear that rule? Any of you, when you grew up, somebody, you, you know, yep, yep, can't go to the movies? How about you can't play with face cards? Anybody ever heard that rule? No, yep, yep, okay. Uh, there's, there's a lot of rules. This is not something just of back then. This is of something even today. We don't add to the scriptures. We draw our faith from the scriptures. So they had this traditional purity that they went about that was a pharisaical purity. It was a ceremonial purity so the Pharisees and the teachers of law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions? Now, some traditions are good, but some traditions are not that good. And, and so they're asking, why, why aren't your disciples following the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? You're not following our rules. How come you're not following our rules? That's basically what's going on here. Jesus is going to expose that this traditional purity is nothing more than a hypocritical purity. The word hypocrite comes from the whole idea of wearing a mask. You know, in the uh, ancient uh, Greek theater, uh, no women were allowed to perform as actors or actresses. They would take young boys whose voice had not yet changed all right? And so they had the higher squeaky voices, and they would memorize the part, and then they'd wear the mask of a woman, and they would play the part of a woman. That was called a hypocrite, because they were pretending to be something they were not. 
Jesus says, he replies, and he quotes from Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 29. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. You're wearing a mask as it is written. The people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What he is saying is, listen, all your ceremonial traditional purity, all that stuff that you do, all your rules and regulations that you're following, all are done lip service. So you can check off your list what you've done, and it never came from your heart. It's all about your heart. Purity is all about your heart. Not only is it a fake uh, hypocritical purity, but is misdirected. You have let go of the commandments of God. You know what he's saying? You've let go of the word of God. You've misdirected the people from what the Bible is actually teaching to something that it is not. This still happens today, folks. Sometimes I'll ask a person, you know, if they know for sure they have eternal life, and they'll say, yeah, I was baptized. Come on, folks, you know, baptism cannot save you. It cannot. Baptism doesn't save you. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses and saves us from all sin, right? Or a person will say, well, I'm a church member, or I'm doing really good. You see, it's a misdirection from the Word of God to something other than Jesus Christ to be my Savior. It happens all the time. You've let go of the word of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. That's the problem. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need the word, not the traditions. We need the word in order to be saved. He says, and and he said to them, "You, you have a fine way of setting aside the commandments of God in order to observe your own traditions. He says in this process of being a hypocrite, you have actually nullified the word of God. Case in point, Jesus says. Let me show you how you're doing this. Moses says in Exodus chapter 20, honor your father and your mother. And Exodus chapter 21 Anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help I might otherwise have received, you might have received from me, is korban. You say, what in the world is korban? Korban in Hebrew, Aramaic, means a gift. And according to their tradition, If you took your stuff and you pronounced it korban, a gift given to God, then you did not have to give it to your mother and father as honor and support of them because, folks, there was no Social Security in that day. Your children took care of you. Whoa. He said, by declaring korban, you have nullified the word of God. And when we say something like, well, yeah, I was baptized to get saved. Well, that nullifies the Word of God because the Word of God says you have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus in order to be saved. It's not baptism. Baptism follows your salvation. It is not your salvation. And, and so what he's saying here is, listen, you are misdirecting and nullifying the Word of God. Thus you nullify the Word of God with your traditions. He says, then it's no longer, you, you do not let them do anything for your father and mother because you, you, and in so doing, you nullify the word of God by your traditions that you've handed down. And he says, you do many like things, which I've been mentioning. Anytime you replace the word of God with something else, you are nullifying the word of God. It's at this point, we get the parable of Purity. Again, Jesus called uh, to the crowd, uh, crowd to him. Before it was just the just, uh, Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now, now he calls to the crowd. He says, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. And he tells them this short parable. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, what it, rather it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Boom, there's the, there's the parable. 
Short little story thrown alongside what was going on to illustrate a point. After he had left the crowd, he entered in the house and the disciples asked him. He said, the disciples don't always get it. You ever been like that? You, you read a part of the Bible and you say, I just don't get that. And so they, they didn't quite get it. So the disciples asked him about this parable that he just threw out there, that little, little short one. I mean, it's really short. He asked him about it. And he says, don't be senseless. Are you so dull? What's wrong with your senses? Aren't you paying attention? Haven't you been watching my life? Don't you know? Don't be blind. Don't you see? Nothing. See, don't miss the point. Here it is. Now, those of you taking notes there, uh, this underlining got left out of the bulletin. You have to write it in. Okay. Don't miss the point. Nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean. Wow. For it doesn't go into his heart. It goes into his stomach. And then out of his body. That's why we all visit the porcelain palace from time to time. <laughs> goes in, goes out. But it doesn't hit your heart. He said, for it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. So it's not what you eat, but somebody said, it's what it's eating you. What's in your heart? It's not what you eat. It's what's eating you. In saying this, Jesus declared, all food's unclean. That's in parenthesis. That's because it's the author of the gospel. He's saying, uh, he drops in a little note. This is the grounds for why we can eat anything. We can eat anything. We can eat anything. And then he goes back to the story. He says, regarding spiritual purity now. Jesus went on to say, you see, defilement. What defiles a man? What makes him unclean? What, what, makes, what, what makes him unholy? What, what, what pollutes the person? What makes a man unclean is what comes out of a man, that's what makes him unclean, defiles him. And then he starts to catalog them. From within or out of man's heart come evil thoughts. Did you ever notice you don't have to teach a child to do something wrong? Did you ever notice that? You never have to teach a child, take that toy away from that other child. You have, no, you teach them, you have to share. Why? We are programmed, we are born evil thoughts. He says, out of the heart come these evil thoughts. The next one is, out of the heart come sexual immoralities. The word in Greek for this is pornea. The word for writing in Greek is grapho. So when you take pornea, grapho together, it comes out as pornography. This is immorality. Technically, it's fornication, but fornication in any of its forms, it's the general term. He said, listen, that affair didn't happen just suddenly. It started in the heart. Deep in the heart, a lust conceived. It led from one thing to another. He said, it started in the heart. What you eat, that pizza that you ate didn't make you do that. You see what I'm saying? It's in the heart. It's in the heart. He goes on and says, theft. Theft. Cheating on my income tax, because I don't think anybody... is still theft. It's stealing. Where's that come from? In my heart. Murder. Now, most of us here aren't murderers, unless you extend it to the degree that Jesus extended it to. He said, if you are angry with your brother, you, it's as if you've already committed murder in your heart against that person. You ever been angry? I'm guilty. There's nothing here I'm saying that, you know, the fingers aren't pointing back at me. I'm guilty. I was angry at my brother. Then you have the word adultery. This is different from the sexual immorality. Adultery is you're married and you're cheating. The other one, you don't necessarily have to be married and cheating. You're married here and you're cheating. So where does this come from? In the heart. To the heart. Greed. Getting greedy 
that you don't have enough. Remember we talked on the one parable, Jesus talked about this before. When is enough enough? And when does it turn over to being greed in my heart? That greed, where does it come from? It comes in my heart. Now you know that, and I'm pointing to my chest, but that's not what he's talking about. The heart is a biblical psychological concept of where you think, where you feel, and where you will in your immaterial part, which is your soul or your spirit. You have a section of that called like the heart. And everything that proceeds from there, he said, inside, deep inside, the you inside the body. And so when I eat, it doesn't touch that me inside the body is why he's saying, what you eat can't make you unclean. It's that inside your soul and your heart proceeds all this junk, malice. You want to know what malice is? Malice is what was in that young man's name by the last name of Cruz who down in Florida shot up the kids in the school. Malice is the whole idea that you have an intention to do something evil and then you will act on it. He had an intention to do evil, to go in and harm other people. That is malice. Where does it come from? I don't want to enter into the whole gun debate. Nope, doesn't come from the guns. I don't want to do the security debate. Don't want to enter into that. Nope, it doesn't come from the security. You know where it comes from? It came from an evil heart. If we're going to fix America, you know what we need? We need revival, folks. We need revival. We need hearts that are turned to God instead of this unclean heart. Instead of worrying about the foods you eat, which they were, the way you wash your hands, the way we do church, the way we sing our songs. Instead of worrying about that, we start worrying about people's hearts. Their hearts need to be turned to God. The next one is deceit, deceiving people, lewdness, promiscuity. (laughs) The TV programs on today would be considered X-rated in 1950s. Lewdness, lewdness. Envy, I want what somebody else has. Where's that come from? In my heart. Slander, this term is blasphemy. When when I run down somebody with my mouth, where does that come from? It's not what went in, it's what comes out. Arrogance is pride. Folly, I like to call that just being stupid. (laughs) That, that's the Henderson translation. <laughs> it's acting like a fool. A fool. And the psalmist says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's stupid. You're better to keep your mouth shut than say something blasphemous like that. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. That's what makes it, not what you eat. We're talking about the heart. Well, you might say, is that all there is? You just listed 13 things. If I can keep away from those 13, am I good? Well, that's not the only vice list in the Bible, I'm sorry, unfortunately, to say. You go to Galatians chapter 5. Let me just read a few more. I'm not going to expound all these. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality. That's the same as in the other texts. Impurity. Debauchery. Living a wild lifestyle idolatry, you know what that is, setting up something else instead of God. Witchcraft. I I will pause for a moment here. The Greek term here is pharmakai. We get the word pharmacy from it. Did you ever notice that all the witches have their potions? Potions. What this verse is actually talking about is drug abuse. A drug abuser. Recreational drugs, not medicinal because drugs are good. You see, everything that is good can be turned to evil. Recreational drugs, that, that, that's what, they called it witchcraft back then because it altered your mind, altered your state. That was witchcraft, okay? Hatred, discourse, jealousy, fits of rage, selfishness, ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, Orgies, and here we go. In case we missed anything, he says, and the like. In case in the 21st century you think of something new that's not on the list, it's covered. If it is something that does not glorify God, he says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit 
the kingdom of God. Whoa. It's not the only list. There's other lists. I won't do them all. But this one's really important. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Wow, that's pretty powerful language. Do not be, be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, same word as we had the other two places, pornea, nor the idolater, nor the adulterer. The difference between that and the other is the one is married, the one may, may or may not be. The male prostitute and the homosexual offender. I know the Bible is not politically correct, folks. This text is saying those who live in that lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of God. I, I'm just the messenger. We love these people, as we're going to see in a moment, but we don't agree with their lifestyle. The male prostitute is actually the passive participant in a homosexual relationship. The other term, homosexual offender, they put the, the offender isn't in there, it's just the term itself says that that is the active participant. The other is the passive, a two people in a process. Nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Whew. I want to tell you that all these evils come from inside and make a man clean. It's not what you eat. It's not the way you wash your hands. It's not the way you comb your hair. It's not the clothes you wear. It's from the inside all these things proceed. So how do I get clean before God? Listen, man, I don't. I've blown it on a few of those. Watch what the text says next in 1 Corinthians. After he's saying that you, if you committed these things, you won't inherit the kingdom of God, and then this is what he says. And that is what some of you were. Folks, that's past tense. The Corinthians were no longer any of those things. They weren't that anymore. Something happened that changed it all. I'm going to suggest to you something happened that cleaned their heart. And it's, it's told us right here. In order to get a clean heart, you've got to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. But you were washed. Washed. 1 John 1, 7 says... The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. I was eight years old when I accepted Jesus as my Savior, and I just prayed, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I didn't know what else to say, but those were my words of faith. And, and I said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. He came in, and he cleaned my heart. I was only eight years old. These people had been involved in all kinds of, of, of sins, but they were washed in the blood. He goes on and says, you need to get sanctified, set apart is what it means. To set apart. So I'm washing the dishes, and I, I take the dirty dishes, and I wash them in the sink, I put them in the, the cleanser, you know, the soap, and it's like, I take the dirty center, and I, I put them in the blood of Jesus Christ, and, and I pull them out, I don't take my dirty dish that I put in a dish, dishwashing detergent, clean it and rinse it all off, and stick it right back in the dirty dishes. I take that dish and I put it in the drainer to let it dry. I set it apart from the dirty. And that's exactly what sanctified means. We are washed in the blood, we are set apart by the Spirit, and then he goes, and you are justified. That clean plate is now declared to be clean. That's clean, you know. Oh, no, don't, don't, you know, don't eat off those dirty ones. Uh, this is the clean plate over here. I declare it to be clean. And when I was a sinner, and I was washed in the blood, set apart, God declares, you are now righteous. You are righteous. You are clean. And what does he always say? Go and sin no more. Will we all ever fall back into it? Yes, we will. But what do we do? If we are faithful and just, if we, if, we are, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and make us pure. Pure. You can do this right now. I don't care what kind of evil has proceeded from your heart in the past. Right now, you can be cleansed. The question is, but how? How do I get cleansed? You go to Jesus confessing. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, 
that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You've got to make a confession of who he is. That he is the Lord. You are no longer calling the shots. He is your Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I notice that he says, believe in your heart, not in your head. Some people miss heaven by about 12 inches. The distance between their head and their heart. They know it all up here, but they've never embraced it in their heart to have their heart cleansed from all unrighteousness. I believe in the very core of who I am, in my heart of hearts, deep down within, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. I confess it with my mouth, and you'll be saved. For it is with the heart man believes, and, and you're justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess, and you are saved. So I have to have this combination of believing from my heart and confessing from my heart who Christ is. And the Bible just says, you just go to Jesus calling on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How do you do that? You go to prayer. And you just say, Lord, I've got a, I've got a dirty heart. I've got a sinful heart. I'm inviting Jesus to come in and with his blood to wash me and purify me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And when you confess him as Lord, Lord, cleanse me now. He will. For he said if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of all of our sins and purify. He'll cleanse us. He'll wash us from all of our unrighteousness. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah said, though your sins be as scarlet like red, they shall be as white as snow when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can do it right now. Let's pray. Father, right now someone is saying, oh man, the word of God has hit me right where I live. I've got stuff going on on the inside of me that it's pretty unclean. And yet, Lord, uh, you have the power to wash and cleanse and purify me from all this garbage in my life. Right now, I call upon you as Lord, who had victory over death and is raised from the dead, to take your blood and wash and cleanse me. Do it now, Lord. Sanctify me. Set me apart. Don't put me back in the pile of dirty dishes, Lord. Set me apart as one of yours. I'm calling on you to do that. Father, I know if anyone has a faith in their heart like that and just, just confesses it to you, you will change them from the inside out. They will become a new creature in Christ. The old will be gone, the new will come. It won't be by their own work, it'll be by the work of God working on the inside. Save them, I pray, who call upon you in this way. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.